Hey guys, this video is a clip from my documentary, Rock is Dead, where I look into the evolution of the music industry, how MTV revolutionized the way music is consumed, what it meant for grunge, and more. If you want to see the full documentary, Rock is Dead, the full movie is available on my channel for free. The link is below. Beginning in the late 1880s, Phonograph records of musical performances became commercially available to the public. Combined with the widespread usage of radio broadcasting starting in the 1920s, the music industry entered a new era. Thus, the record labels, the companies who published, manufactured, and distributed recorded music to the radio broadcasters, they became the most powerful entities in the music industry. This is the location of the first ever music billboard. On August 18, 1966, The Doors signed with Elektra Records, and for the next several months, preparations began for The Doors' first album. On January 4, 1967, The Doors' self-titled debut record was released. Jack Holzman, president of Elektra Records, decided to have a billboard of the Doors placed by the Chateau Marmont. Holzman believed that local DJs would notice the sign on their way to the Sunset Strip just down the road. Some of the most famous clubs in Los Angeles are located at the Sunset Strip, including the Whiskey A Go Go, the venue where the Doors used to be the house band. And since then, billboards have become a standard practice in the music business. The 60s and 70s are largely known for experimental music. The 80s are largely known for music videos. With the introduction of music videos, the biggest change is that it all came, became very quickly about image. On August 1st, 1981, MTV was launched, ushering in the age of music videos. I worked for a record company and at that time and we would go out and look for bands instead of the questions being about well how did they sound or what was their writing like or was it was like well, what they look like you know that was immediately something that became a huge thing because what people realized was pretty quickly it was like hey if they don't have songs well we can get them some songs if they can't play that well well we can use some session guys in the studio to make the record so that became a big thing it's like well but if we got you know, guys that are great performers and look great, we can build every, we can fix everything else around it. I think one of the things that's happened to music as, as, as time has gone on and as we've gotten, you know, headed towards the end of the 20th century and coming into the 21st, one of the things that's happened is, um, you know, that, that the musical side of things became a somewhat diluted, and I, I hesitate to say this, but I, I don't want to, I can't blame any one thing, but MTV didn't help that much because it put more of an emphasis on how somebody looks or what's the video like and how's, how's it presented and how's it, how does it look? How does that music look? <laughs> so the visual of what MTV did uh, and how, how impactfully that sold records, which I witnessed firsthand, is something that completely turned the industry on its head. By the mid to late 80s, a new musical movement was starting to develop in Seattle. A movement which was partly in reaction against the MTV image first kind of music that was being put out there. This movement was grunge. And one of the people at the center of this movement was producer Jack and Dino. Well, I felt like I was right in the middle of a, of a sort of a little renaissance of rock that was going on here in Seattle. Um, you know, I was right in the engine room, as it were, 
And I don't think anyone expected, I don't think any of us expected that, you know, four or five Seattle bands would suddenly be, you know, up in the upper reaches of the Billboard album charts, you know, by 1991, 1992. The beauty of what happened in the Northwest was we were isolated. So, you know, if everyone would have been trying to get a record label in Los Angeles uh, when they were first starting out, maybe they would have been more homogenous. But here, everybody got to do their own thing because it was a punk rock standard. There was a brief period, there have been several brief periods where different idiomatic elements of the underground or the legitimate music scene have been brought to the surface and have been sort of skimmed by that industry, the mainstream industry. And that sort of culminated with Nirvana becoming the biggest band in the world. When they became successful to on an on a international scale and became a huge phenomenon, then that sort of started a feeding frenzy with the big record labels where the big record labels were trying to find a, other like unpolished gems in the underground music scene that they could turn into commodities like that. I was doing pretty well on account of all the records I'd done from the grunge era, meaning the Mud Honey records, the Tad records, the Soundgarden record. The Bleach record has had somewhat of a reappraisal. I've heard rumors that you were considered to work on in utero. Is this true? You know, there were rumors about it, but I never heard anything directly from the band. And in fact, the first time I talked to Kurt about it, he told me that he was planning on recording with Steve Albini. So I thought, well, that puts that to rest. Nirvana were, were peers. We were sort of of the same scene. They, they were in an unusual circumstance in that they had gotten famous, you know. But I still considered them peers. I considered, considered them part of the same circle that we had all grown up in. So working with Nirvana was not intimidating in that respect. The, the pressure that they were under, like, was, it was immediately apparent to me that they were in a different world in that regard. When you recorded in utero back in 1993, what exactly was the issue with Nirvana's label? Long story short, the band recorded the album in utero by hiring me directly. So I was never contractually bound to their record company in any way. That was a break in the paradigm of the way record companies wanted to do business. Record companies wanted to be the responsible party so that they could exert control over situations by withholding payment or demanding things or, you know. If your business depends on you exerting control over the people you work with, and one of those people has a successful record that doesn't obey that protocol, it's a dangerous precedent. I immediately started getting calls from journalists who were getting leaks from the record company in one of those phone conversations was, um, I just got off the phone with Gary Gersh. He says he can't release the new Nirvana album and it's your fault. Would you like to comment? <laughs> there was an effort to shut down that record and make the band do it again. The band dug in their heels to an extent. They said, no, this is the record. We like the record. We want to release it. There were two or three songs that were remixed, but the record that ended up in the stores is the record the band wanted people to hear. And they released a record that they were proud of. Well, it was, I mean, at the time I was, it was the early 90s. And I was, when, when I went, it was going into high school, I was, I was 14. So Nirvana was massive at the time. They, I think they'd just come out with the In Utero. That was the first real style of music I really got into because it was so influential back then and you know it was a different thing than today and that's another thing about today is you don't get these bands um, like Nirvana where everyone starts dressing like them you know everyone as soon as Nirvana came out everyone had to have like the blonde hair down to the shoulders plaid this whole thing it was like a whole movement of not just like I love this band but I want to look like this band do you think that's possible anymore with the internet and how everything's so dispersed? I don't see it anymore. Like, do you still get, like, your punks and your, you know, your goths and, like, your metal guys and they all kind of look... You can kind of say, oh, that guy probably listens to heavy metal by the way he dresses. Um, but you don't really get this thing of, like, a, a, a person looking like a band. Like, you know, like everyone looked like Kurt Cobain at my school. You know, there's a lot of people that had their hair long and wore red plaid and ripped jeans and, you know, and they, everyone's trying to look like Kurt Cobain. And I don't... 
I don't really see that anymore. For the better part of 70 years or whatever, there was a music business that was essentially the record business. So the record business model meant that there was a kind of a, a singular thrust to the industry. And so you had phenomenon bands, massive artists who put out many albums and all of them were heard by everybody, essentially, right? 